But as I am wont to do, I'd like to do a bit of review. In our study of 1 Corinthians over the last few weeks, we've encountered a number of very important truths in this first chapter. First of all, we've learned that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Amen? The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The word message there is logos. And of course, we know that the logos is Jesus Christ himself, the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, the word that was in the beginning with God, the word that was God, the word that is God, amen? Amen. And that word of the cross, that message of the cross, Christ of the cross, is to those who are perishing foolishness. They, they, They don't believe it. They refuse to receive it. They deny its value. They, they even in some instance want to deny its historicity, although there is abundant evidence to the historical reality of Christ and his cross. To them it is foolishness. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. There is a, an interesting thing that's buzzing around social media over the last couple of weeks. Some of you may be aware of it. Others probably know nothing about it. But Russell Brand, how many of y'all are aware? Of, how many of y'all even know who Russell Brand is? Right? Russell Brand got baptized. Russell Brand is a guy who has played on the outer edges of philosophy, theology, and every kind of thinking you can imagine. The guy has tripped on more different types of drugs and and considered more varied kinds of philosophy than almost anybody, and he's done so in a very public manner. He's very new age in all of his thinking, at least he has been up until recently. Recently, Russell Brand began to realize that everything that he had pursued left him feeling empty, nothing satisfied, and so he is professing very vocally on social media and other platforms, he's, he's, he's vocally professing his faith in Jesus Christ, even uh, going so far as to be baptized and to begin to openly share his testimony. And there are many out there who look at him and say, look at what a fool Russell Brand has become, right? Now, I am not here today to validate or invalidate his walk with God or his profession of faith. I'm simply saying that it's interesting that those who previously admired him are now turning on him because he himself has turned to Jesus Christ and has done so in a very public way. Because to them, the message of the cross is foolishness and anyone who would believe it is a fool. But to us, and now apparently to Russell Brand as well, There is this recognition that it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen? Now, Paul illustrates this fact by asking them a question. He says, where is the wise, the scribe, the disputer of this age? God has made their wisdom foolishness. You see, their wisdom says there is no God. Man is his own source of meaning. But what is the proverb tell us the fool has said in his heart there is no God and so their wisdom has become foolishness the Greeks and the Jews alike had missed the mark the Jews sought after a sign the Greeks sought after wisdom but as Paul points out in this first chapter we preach Christ crucified to the Jews it's a stumbling block why why was Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews, why is it something that they would trip over? Now, don't get me wrong. They were looking for a Messiah. They wanted a Messiah. They eagerly anticipated the arrival of the Messiah, but they had in their mind some very specific things that they thought the Messiah would be like, that there would be certain things that the Messiah would do, that there would be a certain role that the Messiah would fulfill, and Christ at his first coming did not fulfill or meet their expectations. And so because of their preconceived ideas, because of their false expectations, they stumbled over the reality that was their Messiah. It tripped them up. 
that Messiah would come and die at the hands of the Romans? No, that could never be. He was to defeat the Romans. He was to liberate Israel from the Romans, not to be tortured and killed by the Romans. That, that made no sense. That, he couldn't be the Messiah. It was to them a, a stumbling block. They, they kept tripping up over the cross. They, they couldn't get around it because they refused to receive it. And a big part of their problem were their preconceived ideas, their, 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 their previously held expectations of what it would be like. And I'm going to tell you something, as Christians in the 21st century, we run the risk of doing the same thing, particularly as it pertains to end times prophecy. We have in our minds a certain expectation of how things are going to unfold. And if things don't unfold in that particular way, we're going we're gonna to struggle with that. You know, we need to be open to let the Lord do things the way the Lord sees fit. Amen? To be open to how he intends for things to unfold. And I think that, you know, one of the purposes of prophecy is not to, to look ahead and predict how things are going to be, but rather to look back and say, oh, God said that was going to happen because it increases our faith. It also warns us how to live. And that is the purpose and the intent. But if our expectations are incorrect, we need to make sure that we are not devoted to our expectations, but rather that we are devoted to God's word. Amen? Now, Paul preached Christ crucified to the Jews. It was a stumbling block to the Greeks. It was foolishness. We've already talked about that. But we know, and Paul knew, and the Corinthians knew, that it was the power of God and that it was the wisdom of God. Paul went so far as to offer the Corinthians themselves as evidence that his claims were true, that God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He essentially said to the Corinthian church, come on, if you want to know that God uses the foolish things of the world, just look at yourselves, man, right? Just look at yourselves, right? You're evidence of the fact that God uses the foolish things of the world, not many mighty, not many noble were called, right? But God has chosen them, the foolish things of the world. They were foolish. They were weak. They were base or low born. They were, they were basically nobodies, right? Nobody special. But his purpose in all this was not to beat them down or to degrade them or to humiliate them. His purpose in all of this was to demonstrate that no flesh should glory in his presence. Amen? No flesh should glory in his presence. There isn't one of us who could say, well, of course God wanted me on his team. I mean, come on, look at me, right? None of us can say that. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all blown it in one way or another. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of us have blown it more spectacularly than others. Some of us blow it quietly. Some of us blow it secretly. Some of us blow it in such a way that it looks like we're not blowing it and we're content to let everybody else think that we're getting it right, which is hypocrisy, which means that we're blowing it even worse than the ones who are obviously blowing it. Do you see what I'm saying there? We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you're sitting here this morning and you're like, oh, I can't believe I'm here. If they knew what I had done, <laughs> boy, if you knew what we had done, right? We are all sinners who need to be saved by the grace of God. And when we have a firm grasp on that, when we, when we truly recognize how unworthy we are of everything that God has done for us, it changes the way we think about our relationship with God and it changes the way that we think about the gospel. I was, um, I was listening to this guy on social media the other day, a really interesting Bible teacher, um, really more of an evangelist, I guess, than anything else. And he was talking about you know, if you ask the average Christian on the street, what is the gospel message? They might say something like, well, God loves you. He sent Christ to die for you. And he has a wonderful plan for your life to bless you and to prosper you. Does that sound like something that people would say? And all of that stuff is true, but that's not the gospel. 
does not. That sounds great if you're talking to someone who has their life in front of them, but, but if you say that God loves you, God has a great plan for your life, and he wants to bless you, and the person you're talking to has weeks left to live because they're suffering from terminal cancer, is that really what they want to hear at that moment? Is that what they really need to hear at that moment? What is the gospel message? The gospel message is we have all sinned. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we are deserving of death, but God, (laughs) in his great love for us, sent his son to die in our place. And that if we will place our faith and our hope and our trust in him, if we will confess him as our Lord and Savior, he will forgive us for our sins and give us the gift of eternal life. That's the gospel. All this other stuff about God having a great plan for your life and wanting to bless you and to use you and to give you purpose, all of that, that's all extra. That's all icing on the cake. That's the bonus stuff that comes from walking with Christ, right? But the heart of the gospel is that we were sinners deserving of death and God sent his son to take our place. That's it. And if he never did anything else for you, that would be enough, wouldn't it? To be reunited in fellowship with him for all eternity, I'd say that will just about do it. Our Christmas list doesn't really need to be any longer than that. Now, as Paul points out in verse 30 of chapter 1, Jesus Christ has become for us the wisdom of God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And he concludes by saying, so he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. If you've got something to boast about, if you've got something to brag about, if you've got something to be happy about, it should be the fact that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Do you remember? When Jesus sent out the disciples and he gave them power to cast out demons and to heal the sick and sent them out to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. And after they came back, they were excited. They were like, wow, even the demons are obedient to the words that we're speaking. God is just moving in such a mighty way. Jesus pulled them in and he said, listen, don't rejoice in this, that the, that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice rather in the fact that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's the bottom line, that's what it's all about. Amen? Amen. Everything else is just living out that reality. But that reality is central. It is key. So he who rejoice, he who rejoices, he who boasts, he who glories, verse 31 says, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Amen? Amen? And that brings us now to chapter two, which is our actual passage for this Sunday. Paul writes in chapter 2, and I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimonies of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen? Jesus is saying, not only were there no mighty, or not not many mighty, rather, not only were there not many mighty, not many noble called, not only does does the, the wisdom of this world seem like foolishness, right, to God, and the wisdom of God seems like foolishness to this world, not only all of this, but here's the thing, not only are there not many noble, mighty, or, or, or great among you, but even me, when I came to you, I didn't come to you promoting worldly wisdom. I didn't come to you with, with, with words only, but I came to you with a very simple message. And it was intentional. It was, in, it was on purpose. Let's read that again. Chapter two, verse one. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul's message when he came to Corinth was the message of 
the cross. It was the message that, as we have previously discussed, said, you're a sinner, you need to be saved. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He was buried, and on the third day, he rose from the grave. And in him, you can have the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. That was the message. Simple, direct. You know, it's interesting. We get into these debates with people about the finer points of Scripture, don't we? And we allow those debates and those discussions sometimes even to divide us. And you'll see believers online criticizing one another because of their interpretation of a particular passage or group of passages. And they'll say, oh, well, you're wrong and you're wrong and I'm right and you're, you know. And there's all this infighting. Why? Because they're getting away from the simplicity of the message of the cross, right? It's not to say that those things aren't interesting. It's not to say that those things aren't worth talking about. But for heaven's sake, they're not worth turning hateful and angry over, are they? Not when we have the centrality of the cross to bring us together. And Paul is saying, look, I'm not getting into all of the nuances. I'm keeping this message simple. I'm keeping it direct. I want you to recognize that I came to you, church in Corinth, proclaiming the message of the cross. And now they're dividing. Oh, I'm of Paul or I'm of Apollos or I'm of Cephas. None of that is the message of the cross. And Paul is reminding them of the word that was first spoken to them, of the word that they first believed. And he goes on to say in verse 3, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen? Now, Paul does not tell us within the context of this letter why he was with them in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. He doesn't go into detail describing the reason for his emotional, physical, or mental, or even spiritual state at the time that he came into Corinth. As I think about that, and I ask myself, why? Why does he just mention this, but he doesn't explain it? It occurs to me that the reason he mentions it without explaining it is because they already understood it. They had seen him when he was there with them in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. They knew why he was there with them in weakness and in fear and in much trembling because they shared the common experience of that time in Paul's life. They had seen him. They had heard him. He's reminding them of what they already know. And so for us, we look at that and we say, well, Paul, why were you in weakness? And why were you in fear, Paul? And, and why were you trembling? And the reality is we can't necessarily know, but we can make some educated guesses. We can draw some inferences based on the evidence that is presented particularly in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, we find that prior to his arrival in Corinth, Paul had been having a pretty tough row to hoe. Things had been difficult for him recently in his ministry. For instance, if we go back just a little ways, we find that in Philippi, the first venture into the European continent that he makes with the gospel, he is beaten and thrown in jail because he cast a demon out of a little girl, right? No good deed goes unpunished, it would seem. But her masters, her owners, used to profit from her because she would tell fortunes. And when Paul cast the demon out of her, all of a sudden that ability to tell fortunes was gone and they had lost their stream of income. And so they dragged Paul before the magistrates, had him stripped naked, he and Silas, and, and had him beaten and thrown into prison, into the, the lower parts of the dungeon where they were put in stocks. And around midnight, Paul and Silas began singing the praises of God. Amen? And a great earthquake came and, and their bonds were released and the 
Philippian jailer came out and was like going to fall on his sword because he thought all the prisoners had escaped. And, and they're like, no, 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 don't hurt yourself. We're all still here because they were all still there. No one had left, right? No one had run away. And his response is, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they told him to repent and believe and to be baptized. And that day he and all his household were saved. But, you know, as wonderful a story as that is, and as miraculous a chain of events as that was, and as glorious an end as that story had, let us not forget that it began with Paul and Silas being stripped naked, beaten, and thrown in prison. Not what you would call a great day, right? They move on from Philippi to Thessalonica, and it got so bad in Thessalonica that they literally had to sneak Paul out of town in the middle of the night. And they take off from Thessalonica, they go to Berea. And things are going well in Berea. They're actually getting a hearing and people are studying the scriptures to see if the things that Paul has said are true. But the rabble from Thessalonica find out that Paul and Silas are in Berea and they follow him there and start causing trouble in Berea. And it's such a distraction to everything that's going on that Paul leaves Berea, leaving Timothy and Silas to stay there and continue the work. But Paul, the figurehead of the ministry, the one that was drawing all the fire, he got out of Dodge. And he ended up going to Athens. Now in Athens, Paul reasoned with the people there. He was at the Areopagus and he was reasoning with the philosophers and he was espousing to them this, this new thing that they had never heard of, but he was showing them how it really was something that they had known but not realized they had known all along as they had this altar to the unknown God. And he was there to declare to them who this unknown God was. And yet even though he reasoned and, and, and used wonderful rhetorical strategies and persuaded them and, and even used quotes from poets that they would have known, just this beautiful presentation of his apologetic as he brought forward the word of God, the reality was very few of them responded. Very few of them. It was, one could argue, a ministerial failure. Now, does that mean no one believed? No, there were some. But most of them did not believe. I mean, have you ever noticed we don't have an epistle to the church at Athens? We don't. They were too smart for their own good. They were the wise men of this world, and to them the gospel message seemed like foolishness. And so they did not believe. And so now Paul rolls into Corinth. He's by himself. Silas and Timothy haven't joined him yet. He's on his own, essentially. He has experienced beatings. He's been snuck out of town. He's had to leave because of riots. He's received, at best, a lukewarm welcome in Athens. His confidence at this point is shaken. You know, we think of Paul, the mighty apostle Paul, right? But sometimes we forget. When you get right down to it, he was just a guy. A guy who was empowered by God, a guy who was called by God, but still just a vessel, just a human being, just like you, just like me. And what's more, Paul considered himself to be the chief of sinners because he at one time had persecuted the church of God. And so when bad things happened to him, there had to be that voice that said, I probably deserve this, right? Don't you sometimes hear that voice that tells you when things go bad, when people reject you, when things are hard, isn't there that voice that says, man, I probably deserve this, right? And we forget how much God loves us, how much he cares for us, how much he sacrificed in order to save us. And so Paul's fear and hesitation were such that upon his arrival in Corinth, he actually needed encouragement from the Lord to even carry on. How do we know that Paul needed encouragement from the Lord? Because the Lord provided him with encouragement. God speaks to Paul in a vision in Acts chapter 18. Let's go ahead and turn there. Starting in verse 1, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy, and his wife Priscilla, 
because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation. They were tent makers. You know, when we talk about people who uh, find creative ways to access uh, certain parts of the world where missionaries are not accepted, they have to go in on visas to work in other ways. And they, they work to provide for themselves and the ministry, and we call those people tent makers. And the, reasons, the reason we call them tent makers is because Paul was literally a tent maker, and he worked to support himself in the ministry. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Now what does that tell us? It tells us that prior to that, he had been leading up to it, but had never actually gotten there, right? He had been reasoning with the Jews, very likely about the Messiah, about the fact that the Messiah was coming, about the fact that the Messiah would have to suffer, maybe even talking about how the Messiah would have to die, but he had not yet declared to them that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And it wasn't until Silas and Timothy arrived that the Spirit compels him to say it. Paul had been holding back. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, so you see they had listened to him previously, but now that he's coming forward and saying, look, it's Jesus Christ, they, they opposed him and they blasphemed kind of like what we were talking about at the beginning with Russell Brand, right? Lots of them loved to listen to him, liked what he was saying because it aligned with what they wanted to hear. But the moment he starts to say that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that there's salvation in his name, then what happens? They turn on him, right? And that's what was happening to Paul. When they opposed him and blasphemed, Paul shook out his garments and he said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Now, even though things have begun to turn around, even though th these positive things are starting to happen, even though there have been these divisions between the Jews and Paul has basically said, look, I gave you the truth. You wouldn't listen. It's on you now. And he goes to the Gentiles. Even though all these things are happening, Paul was still struggling with this discouragement. And we know that he was because of the next verse. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. And here's what the Lord said to him. Do not be afraid. Now, does God say, do not be afraid unless you were afraid? No. When, when, when God speaks to Joshua, he says, do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go, right? What was Joshua about to do? Lead an invasion force into the promised land against numbers that far exceeded their own. And there was reason to fear. But God said, hey, don't be afraid. When the disciples were out on the Sea of Galilee, fighting the wind and the waves, trying to make it to the other side where Jesus had sent them, and then in the middle of the night, they see someone walking on the water. Is there a reason to be afraid? Oh, come on. Yes, there's a reason to be afraid. If you're out on a cruise ship, and you're, you know, in the middle of a storm, and you're standing out there on the deck hanging on to your life preserver, and you look out and you see someone walking on the water, I guarantee you, you're not going to say, ooh, let me get a selfie with that guy, right? <laughs> no, you're going to be freaking out. I don't know, some of you might, I don't know. But what does Jesus say to them? Fear not, it is I. He tells us not to be afraid when we are afraid. And we need to hear that word from him. Now, some of us want to live, how many of you want to live a good life? Yeah. 
And by a good life, you mean you've always got enough money to pay your bills, you've always got a place to stay, you've always got plenty of food to eat on the table, your friends and your family are around you, everybody's happy, everybody's healthy, everybody's doing well. I mean, let's be honest, we want that life, don't we? But may I say that may not be the best life for us? Perhaps we need struggle. Perhaps we need strife. Perhaps we need at times to be in want because those things drive us to dependence upon God. Can you imagine that it was good for you that you were afflicted? That's what the psalmist said. It was good for me that I was afflicted. It's good for me that I went through hard times. It's good for me that I've faced difficulties because coming out on the other side of those, I can look back and see that it was God who sustained me through them. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. At times, Paul had been tempted to keep silent. At times, Paul, in fact, had kept silent. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. So what was he afraid of? He was afraid of being attacked. He was afraid of being hurt. Did Paul have good reason to be afraid of being attacked and of being hurt? He had been attacked in the past. He had been hurt in the past. And let's just face it, guys, there comes a point in time where you've hit your head against that brick wall one too many times, and you're just like, I don't think I can do that again. Do not be afraid. But speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Now, is that a blanket promise that all of us can claim for ourselves in every circumstance and situation of our lives? No, (laughs) it is not. There are going to be some times, there are going to be some places where people are going to attack you and they are going to hurt you. Paul had had times when people had attacked him. Paul had had times when people had hurt him. And following Christ is no guarantee that you will not be attacked. In fact, it's often quite the opposite. It's no guarantee that you will not be hurt. It is definitely the opposite. But in this instance, in this moment, in this place, in this time, Paul needed this encouragement. Paul needed this promise. And when God gives you a promise, you can count on that promise. Paul could count on this promise because the Lord had said to him, Paul, don't be afraid. In in essence, the Lord said, Paul, I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to speak forth boldly. I want you to do the work that I've called you to do because the reality is there are many people in the city who belong to me and I've sent you to them, right? We had a situation not so very long ago in this ministry that pales in comparison to what Paul was facing. And yet, it required an act of faith on our part. The building that we had inhabited for 17 or more years was about to be demolished. And we had been told that we were going to have to evacuate the premises. And so we began to look for a place to meet. The thing is, is we had had the same facility and the same rent for 17 years And we had gotten into a very comfortable place. We were making the budget every month. We weren't really growing, but we weren't really shrinking. We were just existing, right? And we had become complacent. Look, I'll confess, as the pastor, as a bivocational pastor in particular who has a full-time job that I do outside of the church, I personally had gotten into the routine of doing church. And I needed something to jar me and to wake me up. And knowing that they're going to be bringing a demolition crew to your facility in the not-too-distant future does have a tendency to do that. And so we began to look, we began to search, we began to pray and seek for where God would have us go. And there were a number of options that were presented. Some were more affordable than others. And some were, were bigger or smaller, as the case might be. And, and finally, the Lord 
brought this place to our attention. And we came and looked at it, and, and, and uh, you know, the, the floor was a patchwork quilt of different tile and carpet designs because it had been a flooring store before. And the reality was this place was more than we could afford. It was more than we could afford. And we negotiated and negotiated and negotiated and were ready to walk away on multiple occasions. And then when the time finally came for us to make a decision, we were not completely unified in what to do. We weren't sure, you know. I wanted to go to a smaller place in Burleson that was considerably less expensive, but also considerably smaller. And as you look at how we're struggling for space already, it would not have worked, right? It was not where God wanted us to be, but it was within my comfort zone. And I felt good about it. But as we prayed and as we looked at it, we sought counsel and we were encouraged to truly consider this place. And, and one young man in our, in our group, I'll not mention him by name so that it doesn't cost me $5, um, <laughs> said, look, are we going to believe God or not? If God has called us here, he's going to provide, and we need to be willing to step out and to trust him. That was the word we needed. The group came together in unity around the decision. We prayed. We came out here, and we began the work of, of transforming this place into what you see it is now. And praise the Lord for giving us some skilled brothers and sisters who were able to do almost all of the work themselves, almost all. And God has blessed us. And the majority of you that are sitting here today would not be sitting here had we not taken that step of faith. Amen? We were afraid. But God's response was, don't be afraid. Step out in faith. There are people who I have that are supposed to be here. And if we hadn't been obedient, then we wouldn't have experienced that blessing. Amen? Now, does that mean that every ministry everywhere should always make decisions that extend beyond the range of their budgetary constraints? No, of course not. But we needed to be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit in a particular situation, and that's exactly what was going on with Paul here. The Lord is saying to Paul, don't be afraid, but speak and don't keep silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Amen? This was Paul's longest stop here on this second missionary journey up to this point. Nowhere else had he been able to invest or to spend this kind of time. And Paul is reminding them here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that when he was there with them, that he was with them in weakness, that he was with them in fear and in trembling. For I determined, he said, not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, is that to say that there is not wisdom to be found in the Lord? Of course, it doesn't mean that. In fact, goes, Paul goes on here in verse six to say, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Amen? But it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Paul is making the case that there is wisdom in the message of the cross, that there is wisdom in Christ, 
but that that wisdom is something that requires maturity to receive, that it requires maturity to understand. And he's essentially saying to them, listen, I had to stick to the basics with you. Why? Because you lacked maturity to understand the deeper things. Now, when we move from the simple teaching of the gospel message, when we move from the proclamation of the cross into other doctrines, into other teachings from the scripture, it requires a certain degree of maturity on the part of those who are being taught so that they can understand and receive the things in which they are being instructed. But specifically, as Paul is speaking of this mystery, what he is speaking about is the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of the cross. Now, what does he mean by mystery? Does he mean that he's going to go around with a magnifying glass looking for footprints? There's a blues clue. There's another clue. Or is it like, you know, some CSI thing where we're looking for evidence and we're trying to sort it out? No. The way that the gospel writers, the way that the New Testament writers rather are using the word mystery here is to say that there was something that was previously hidden that has now been revealed. Previously, we did not know it nor understand it, but now because God has revealed it, we do understand it and we do know it and it is the mystery that he speaks of. Turn with me to 1 Peter, if you will. And Peter will expound on this for us a bit as well. 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll start in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, that is reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, in this salvation, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end or the purpose or the result of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. Amen. Of this salvation, the salvation of your souls, this is what Peter's talking about. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So in other words, as the prophets are writing down these things about the coming Messiah, they were perplexed. They didn't understand. They were like, what in the world is this that the Spirit is having us write down? This doesn't make sense to us. It, it, it was concealed. It was hidden even from them. But then in verse 12, we read that to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering. The things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Like the angels are like, Lord, what, what are you doing? Look, you're becoming, what, 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 what in the world? Is he gonna, whoa, he died. And for them, why? Can you imagine how perplexed the angels must be as they look at what Christ has done for you and, and for me? They desire to look into it. It's a curiosity to them. The prophets themselves didn't even understand what they were writing except to say that they knew they were writing not for themselves but for us upon whom the ends of the age have come. It was a mystery and that mystery has been revealed in the person 
of Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, if, if those who were in authority realized what was going to happen, they would not have crucified the, the Lord of glory. Think about it. Who is he referring to there in Acts chapter, not Acts, excuse me. Who is, he, who is Paul referring to there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, he says, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So when he says the rulers of this, this age, who is he talking about? Is he talking about the rulers of this age, meaning the Romans? They're the ones who actually carried out the crucifixion. Is he speaking of the rulers of this age as in the Sanhedrin and the high priests? I don't, I don't think so. Although maybe because they're the ones who rejected Christ, they were the rulers of the people at that time, and it was their rejection that led to his crucifixion. There's another possibility, though, and it's one that I kind of lean towards in my own thinking on this. The, who is the ruler of this age? The prince of the power of the air. Who is it? Satan. If Satan had realized that by crucifying Christ, he was defeating himself, do you think he would have done it? I don't think so. I think he was a patsy in this whole thing. He thought he was killing the Son of God. Little did he know that it wasn't going to stick. Little did he know that it was God's plan from the beginning. Why? Because it was a mystery and it was hidden it was hidden, and now it's been revealed. You don't show your opponent the cards that are in your hand. You wait until that royal flush is full, and then you lay the cards down, right? Not that God was gambling with our salvation, but I do believe that that is what's being referred to here. Can I prove it? No. Can I say definitively that I'm correct? Absolutely not. Would I argue with anybody on this point? No, not really. But this is what I think. I think that when it says the rulers of this age, had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I think if Satan knew what the result was going to be, he'd have stayed as far away from Jesus as he could have. But I want you to notice this right here. Look at how Paul refers to Jesus Christ. He calls Jesus the Lord of glory. What more magnificent title could be conferred upon him? The Lord of glory. Is there any doubt that Paul recognized the deity of Jesus Christ? But as it is written, Paul said, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We've heard this verse before, right? Usually we've heard this verse in the context of maybe a funeral, right? You're, 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 you're there at the graveside and the casket is being lowered into the ground and the pastor in those resonant tones says, for I has not seen nor ear heard nor, you know how that goes, right? It's a beautiful passage, isn't it? And it makes us think of heaven. We have no idea what glories await us, but here's the thing, that passage is not talking about heaven. I mean, heaven, I'm sure, is all of those things. But when Paul writes here, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for those who love him, he's talking about the message of the gospel and our salvation. Amen? That's what I had not seen. That's what ear had not heard. That's what had not even entered into the heart of man that we could be saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? that God would send his own son to suffer and to die upon the cross to pay the price for your sins and for mine. What an unthinkable act of love and self-sacrifice that is. I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them 
to us. How do we know that the gospel message is true? Because God has revealed it to us. How do we know that the way to be saved is through faith in Jesus Christ? Because God has revealed it to us. We didn't come up with this plan on our own. This wasn't our idea. This wasn't some cleverly crafted story that the disciples put their heads together to come up with and decided that they would each be willing to die for this lie. No, this was revealed by the Spirit of God. God has revealed these things to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? In other words, who would know the mind of God except for the spirit of God? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Does anyone really know your mind? Does anyone really know the things that go through your mind? Your spirit knows, right? Same with the Lord. Who would know the mind of God? the one to whom God has revealed it by his spirit. Verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. So why is it that the wisdom of God seems like foolishness to men? Because they do not have the Spirit of God by which they could understand these things. But the natural man, Paul writes in verse 14, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So here is a hint for you. A little piece of of evangelistic stratagem, okay? If you want to share the gospel with someone, don't go in cold. Don't go in cold. Send the Holy Spirit ahead of you, amen? Pray that God would send his Holy Spirit to open the eyes of their understanding so that when you present the gospel, they will be able to receive it because the Spirit is awakening their hearts and minds that they might understand. Too often, we try to win an argument rather than trying to win a soul. Amen? It isn't our arguments that bring people to Christ. It's the drawing of His Spirit that brings people to Christ. And we need to remember that. He who is spiritual, verse 15, says, judges all things yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen? Amen. We have the mind of Christ. Why are we able to understand the message of the gospel? Because we have the mind of Christ. Because the Spirit of God that understands the things of God has been imparted to us so that we now may also understand the things that God has declared to us because the spirit that comes from him now dwells in us. And we can't look at the world and become frustrated that they don't get it. They don't have the resources with which to get it. But we need to be a light and a witness to them and we need to pray for them that God would pour his spirit out that they might receive that implanted seed which is able to save their souls. And the light of God will then shine in their lives as well.